Okay, we're live. So uh, I guess we're doing this. So, uh, I guess we're doing this. All right, everyone. Well, welcome to the inaugural episode of the cast strength podcast um hopefully there's gonna be a lot more um of these in the future uh we're gonna try and make this a weekly thing uh joining us today as always is gonna be josh galladay and myself vito galliardi we're gonna be doing the hosting duties uh josh how you doing over there huh oh sorry vito uh i was just lost in this delectable glass of sweet and salty luxury of uh talisker 18 which which I've just sadly bottled down. Ooh, you know, there's a song for that kind of thing. I, think I gonna... know. I don't think I'm going to be singing it today, though. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, all right. And um, behind the glass, the virtual glass, <clears throat> the demi god, demi host, we're going to call him the demi host here, Brad Leclerc. What, what, what's, what's this? That, that's me. Hi. That's that's you. How you doing? How's it going, man? I'm good. Good, good. I'll be in the background causing chaos. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. What's what's in your glass? Nothing yet, but it's about to be Talisker 25, I think. You you skip the glass, go straight for the bottle. 25. You've got an older Talisker than I do right now. Well, I just thought I I thought I'd bring this one out here just to make you a little bit jealous. Don't you dare. <laughs> For those for those listening, what is uh, what is on your hand right now? This right here, it's a a Talisker 1985, which Ooh. comes in this very fancy box with a little book. And uh, well, this belongs to Brad, but I have it right now. So who knows? If uh, Brad doesn't behave himself, then maybe I get to sample it before he does. Fighting words, fighting words. <laughs> All right. So um, for um starters we're gonna just lay out a couple of uh a couple of um expectations or ground rules or i guess you could say um we're gonna be doing live streams um and um uh, for everyone that joins us for them um feel free to list out any questions uh, that you might have um we're gonna be taking um tally of them at the end and answering a couple of them um we really appreciate any feedback, uh, positive and negative, anything that uh, we can do to make this a little bit better. Um, you know, not everyone's gonna be 100% happy, but we're gonna do our best to uh, do what makes us happy, do what makes a bunch of people happy, have a good time and uh, have some fun. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna give a pre-show grade and I'm gonna say a B plus. B at best. At best B plus. It's, it, yeah. That's all you can really hope for, I think. <laughs> so uh, having said that, uh, let's get into this. So um, I guess we're going to start with a bit of whiskey news. <clears throat> and um, I guess it's International Share Week uh, this week. And um, being uh, very much we lost Vito's audio. We've lost Vito. Oh, no. Josh, it's on you. Oh, oh, shit. It's on me. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you better get that uh, audio fixed real quick, Vito, because I don't know what the hell I'm doing here by myself. Can you hear me? Oh, my God. He's back. I'm back. He's back again. I need Growing pains. Growing I'm pains. So lost. So, all right. So, everyone knows that uh, there's a lot of whiskey that's matured in uh, sherry casks and a bunch of other wine casks as well, but sherry being dominant, especially in the Highlands and Speyside area. And uh, this week, um, Tamdu is running a bunch of events, which is uh, which looks pretty interesting. They got, uh, you know, um, videos and how to's, a bunch of photography. Um, highlighting um, the influence that the sherry casks have had on the whiskey industry and uh, just making a little bit more 
um, you know, uh, for everyone that hasn't had sherry or only has sherry because of whiskey, um, getting a little bit of a traction there. You know, uh, the more sherry that is drank, the more barrels that we have to make whiskey. Well, you know what's interesting about it? I like the uh, I like the name they're giving it the Spain to space side because uh, sherry is the, the the sherry capital, if you will, is Jerez, Spain which uh, happens to be in the region of Andalusia, which is one of the best, I think the best Texas distilleries called Andalusia Whiskey Company. So um, did you know that often, not always, but often uh, those sherry casks, they put sherry in them and they age them is specifically for whiskey production. The sherry actually doesn't get, doesn't always get bottled and drank. Like distilleries may get barrels made to their specifications with the kind of sherry that they want just to age the whiskey in it later. I did not know that. I know uh, Glenn Goyne is one that does that, for example. And I'm learning something and that's what this is all about. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's really cool. It's, um, and you know, uh, if you're not one for uh, sherry finished whiskeys um, or any of the Highlander space sides, definitely give it, give it a chance. Try blending it. Try putting, uh, doing some mixes. Um, something good that I um, can suggest, and I'm going to probably get a little bit of a little bit of heckling for this. But uh, monkey shoulder is mm. is very very good for that. Um, you brought up the forbidden monkey. Man. I brought up I brought up the the taboo whiskey. Oh. Um, super smooth, <laughs> uh, but it's it's really good because on their website. Um, they have a lot of cocktails uh, that are geared uh, to be made with monkey shoulder. So That's if you're not really the intention, right? Is yeah. it's, it's a blend. You can drink it neat, but it's it does well in cocktails. Right? Yeah. So if you're not if you're not one for that and want to try getting into it, that's a really good way. I, I I've um, had a success in with other types of whiskeys is starting in cocktails and working my way into neat. Um, so if you're not one for that, that's an, that's an option for you, right? Um, it's International Sherry Week, so uh, you know, let's uh, let's show some, some love to sherry, sherry you, and sherry casks. Have you had much sherry by itself? I've been meaning to go. I, I've heard this is a good way to to pick up the different types of sherry influence in whiskey is to go and buy some of the varieties of sherry and try them and get to know them a little bit, so that then when you have a sherry finished whiskey or a sherry aged whiskey, you can pick that up more readily. I haven't recently. Um, I used to dabble a little bit into it over the holidays with my family. My family being Italian, there's always sherry, port, all sorts of weirdness um, at gatherings. So I've used to drink a bit of it, but not very much. And that was well before my my drinking for enjoyment, uh, not so much for pleasure. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I'm 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 gonna just keep that in mind next time I'm at the liquor store, pick up a bottle and. Uh, and definitely do that. What are your What are your favorite sherry influenced whiskeys, personally? Um, well, I bottled down a Glendronic Twelve, and that's sherry and Oloroso. Mm -hmm. Um, probably the Udo. Yeah, I was like Udo, right? Just the the way the way it influences the that smoky peat and ash is just absolutely fantastic. It just interacts so well with it. Mm -hmm. um, Aberlour is another good one. Uh, was, yeah. If you want kind of that, you know, rich, fruity, desserty thing, but uh, yeah, I'd probably go with Ugadal as well, or the Kiloman uh, Seneg. Seneg is delicious as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely really, really good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What and about you, Brad? Sherry finish. Uh, sherry finished stuff, basically none. I never drink wine. Uh, uh, I have basically no experience outside of whiskey that has been finished in things, but uh, I probably should. But it feels like research, and I don't. I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That feels just, like work, man. Yeah, I mean, whatever. <laughs> I guess it's a good. It's a good idea. I'm just saying, I probably won't because I'm lazy. But it it is a very good idea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, cool. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, I've been meaning to pick up some of those sherries and, and, you know, just a handful to kind of try them out and learn the differences between the different varieties and stuff. So probably in the next month or so, next time I go to the liquor store, I'll pick up some of that stuff. I don't think it's terribly expensive either, really. Uh, no, um, if I recall, I think they'll range, well, um, an American, they'll probably range from like 50, 10 to 25, probably. 
So somebody was asking, uh, um, after the sherry's out of the cask, what happens to the cask? Is it washed and then charred or whiskey goes straight in it? I think that's really something that there's no, there's no rule on that, right? Like the distiller can do whatever he wants. Um, you know, so they may char it and reuse it. Uh, they may pour whiskey straight back in it. Uh, at a certain point, the barrel breaches the end of its life. But yeah, yeah. Uh, one 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 day, what we'll what we'll do is we're gonna have a couple of guest spots, and I think we might have um, a uh, a very special ex Cooper that uh, can shine some light on barrel and barrel ages and how that's dealt with. So, would you, would you say that we know people? We might know a couple of people. So, we so, know people who know what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> we know not, we know nothing. nothing. Well, hold on. One of us here is a sommelier. This is true. One is that's, a real that's, genuine sommelier. That, that's like a black belt in karate. It just means I'm up to the task of starting to learn. I, you know, <laughs> Fair I'm enough. at the beginning of my journey. All right. Very good. Very good. Uh, all right. Next article. Um, Josh, you know what? You take the reins on this one, buddy, because I know how passionate you are about this topic here. It really is something that it gets me fired up. I think. Uh, oh. So we all Poor know. Choice we, of words, Josh. <laughs> Poor choice of words. We, we all know and love the actress Gwyneth Paltrow, right? But uh, she's known for for her her new website that sells things. Uh, goop. What's goop? The goop. <laughs> the the goop. G O O P uh, Goop, yeah. Uh, so there was an article. Uh, I think you didn't you find it, Vito, and then you sent did, it to I, me, and, and, I, and I, I was very frustrated with that. Unfortunately, I did find it, and unfortunately for you, I shared it with you. Yeah. And unfortunately for everybody here joining us, get ready for this one. So the article, the the headline poses the question: Should we all be drinking whiskey in the bath like Gwyneth Paltrow? Uh, the Goop founder, Gwyneth Paltrow, the actress, apparently learned it, learned in London to drink seven days a week while taking a bath. I'm not sure I'd recommend that, really. Getting drunk in the bath, first of all, probably a terrible idea. Uh, wouldn't you agree? I would agree wholeheartedly. Second uh, of all, there, there are a lot of ladies out there in the whiskey world, awesome women who I would take whiskey advice from all day long, but... I don't know if I'd take it from an actress that sells jade eggs and pseudoscience on the internet, you know? One of the biggest um, things I've had I've had an issue with with this is that there's a lot of people that are going to uh, blindly follow her for, unfortunately, um, just because of her influence. Mm -hmm. um, and there, one thing I, 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 I had already, I already knew that in Japan, um, it's not common to have alcohol near hot springs or saunas and stuff like that. Um, however, and that's because um, alcohol consumption is one of the main reasons of dying in the bath in Japan. Oh, wow. Um, so, um, Nick, first, that. you drink, you keep drinking, it's warm, you're relaxed, you go to sleep, you might, the, drown, right? you might, you might drown. Um, so, and, and her, and her, stance drinking specifically i think she i think it was uh japanese whiskey preferably yeah her a japanese yeah, whiskey right. in hot in hot tubs is um is a little bit of a slap to the face uh to, well I, I guess yeah for a slap in the face for uh, like you know a country that's had to deal with uh somewhat of a somewhat of a problem um and it it, it causes death it can it can lead to like unfortunate death and um you know um if you know anyone that uh brings us up please let them know that there are very serious consequences um if not handled properly however on the other side of things if you agree with gwyneth paltrow and you want to support her you can go to her website and buy a whiskey decanter set oh yeah a uh it's a it's a glass with a stopper and a little tray to put it on and it's 160 dollars um and not to not to there's another product as well on her website and this isn't this isn't a plug we're not sponsored by her because we're we're <laughs> we're, we're we're clearly not sponsored by her uh, wait till but, next week when we will be yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um one of the descriptions to one of her decanter sets whiskey decanter sets um it makes any whiskey scotch or bourbon about 
1,000 times more enjoyable. <laughs> now, if, if anybody happens to come across this, just by chance or by a mooching of sorts, mm. um, test it. I, I would love to know if it indeed makes any whiskey, scotch, or bourbon 1,000 times more enjoyable. I like how it's just, they, they, Goop has left themselves an out there by using the word about. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's roughly it's a 1,000 times. Somewhere between zero and a 1,000% better. <laughs> yeah, approximately. Yeah, science. It's, it's very scientific what they're doing over there. So, yeah. Uh, so, what was uh, what was the next bit? Oh, uh, do you hear that there was this warehouse that collapsed? A warehouse? Yes, it had whiskey in it. And I think, I think they were ha Metallica came to play a concert at the site of the collapse because wow. they were, they were going to barrel that. They were going to take that whiskey in the barrels and then put it into bottles or something like that, and then. And I think McAllen was involved somehow. They had some really expensive whiskey. I don't know. There was a lot going on with that warehouse collapse. I didn't hear about this, but uh, I wish I wish I'd been there. I'm a big Metallica fan. I would have loved to have seen them ravage a uh, whiskey barrel house. I, would that not be that would be the most metal whiskey event of all time? Just collapse, destroyed warehouse. Metallica <laughs> made, there's just barrels everywhere, and then like James Hetfield just takes this like million dollar bottle of McAllen and just chugs it, slams it on the stage and goes straight into like seek and destroy. <laughs> that, <would> be, <laughs> that is a vision of dreams for me right there. <laughs> you could die a happy man. If you saw that happen, if, if I saw that happen, Oh, that'd be great. But <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of, a little bit of fun there for the chat. Uh, with, uh, with the barrel collapse. Um, so that's uh, that's this week in news and whiskey news. Professional whiskey journalism. Yes, yes, only the highest standards. Just the highest. Yep. Um. So, um. After the after the news, we're gonna we're talking about um a rare, a fairly large topic here, um, which we're gonna call the heart cut. Now, there's always a bunch of questions that we see online. Uh, what's the best glassware for drinking whiskey? Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of questions out there about glassware and a lot of people that say it doesn't matter and the people are too obsessed with it and and uh, people have their different preferences and they don't like this glass and they do like that glass. So uh, we kind of listed some of our favorites and the ones that we own and a few a few that we've used but don't don't own personally. But yeah, there's um, there's something to be said um, about um, glassware um it should be pretty much the same ideal idea as whiskey drink your whiskey out of the glass that you want to however you best enjoy it there's no best one to drink your whiskey out of um i recently had a revelation recent a uh, couple nights ago that I, get to. Um, I enjoyed a, out of a specific glass but i will not be asking for this glass at other uh, establishments so um yeah so let's get into it uh okay the top uh glass where that um uh, or glass that we see around is the glencairn glass of course the glencairn's the like industry standard right every place has them this one's from balcones but um I like to actually, I have a, I have a bunch of Glencairn glasses. Anytime I go and visit a distillery that offers them, you know, as something you can buy merchandise wise, I'll collect one and, and, you know, add it to the collection as a memento of going there. So, um, obviously the design's real focused, right? It gets everything right to the nose. Um, it's, it's kind of a standard that everybody can agree on. It, yep. it can be a little funky to hold. You kind of got to grip it by the base there. Right. And then, uh, sometimes it can kind of, um, you get something like a barrel proof bourbon that's really in your face uh, can kind of just be a little aggressive and a little focused. Sometimes I like to use a different glass for stuff like that. But generally speaking, if I'm drinking whiskey, I'm re reaching for a Glencairn. That's uh, just kind of what everybody's become accustomed to, I think. Yeah, I, apparently I'm having audio issues. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure that, uh, you know, I uh, don't lose any of the zero dollars uh, <laughs> it's fine. We'll talk your pay later. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I prefer in so at home. I have a bunch of Glencairns. This is my preferred 
uh, method of drinking whiskey at home. Um, is that the Magnificent Bastard one? This is the Magnificent Bastard one. Look at that. Yeah, buddy. I so can't skin fancy. It. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is my preferred method at home and at um, at whiskey uh, bars. So um, at the couple of whiskey bars I've been to, they actually have a wide, a fairly good range. They have um, uh, Glencairns, they have Copitas, um, and a little bit of a wider sort of a Rideau style glass um, mm -hmm. that um, I haven't really seen anywhere else, but it works. Um, there, I have no problems. They, I have, they know they're accustomed to it. They know how to serve whiskey pretty much, right? But at, right. at, at general bars, if I'm out and I feel like a uh, Glen Fittick or whatnot, they're not going to have anything like that. So I'll, I'll take it in a, in a rocks glass, you know, mm -hmm. no problem. Um, it's not, you know, I yeah, try a lot to... of times we'll get something like this guy, just a regular rocks glass. Which yeah. Is, and I like sometimes if I'm just going to pour some bourbon and I'm sitting down and just not really thinking about it, not really trying to learn the whiskey or anything like that. Uh, this is perfectly fine. Yeah. I mean, works great. So uh, also if you're going to make an old fashioned or some other kind of cocktail, then, you know, it's perfect it's per for that. Yeah. Perfect for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Ne next, we have a copita. Um, now, none, none of us actually own. Yeah, none of us really own it, uh, but it is a long stem. Um, mm -hmm. I have something here similar, right? So, for those that don't know, so this is a grappa glass, but um, the copita has a long stem and then essentially just a miniature Glencairn on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, very fancy glass. Um, who's uh, Dal the Dalmore guy? Um, Wade, Wade's a Dalmore guy. No, no. Um, the main. Oh, oh I, I know who you're talking about. Uh, um, Richard Patterson. Richard Patterson loves <laughs> loves his copitas. Um, his videos are hilarious. Throw the whiskey um, on the floor, guy. Yeah. Um, so the copitas really really nice. Um, just really fancy. Um, not my favorite. Um, just because of I have to the way I have to hold it and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. but does his perp does his job uh, wonderfully. Um, pretty much just, you know, a, a long stemmed miniature Glencairn. Yeah. I, th I, I kind of agree with Mike here in the chat though. I do like it sometimes because part of the point of having a stem on the glass is so that your hand doesn't warm up the whiskey. Yeah. Inadvertently, but you know, uh, if you grab it by, grab the, by the base, by yeah. the base, it's not too bad, but yeah, I, I like a Copita. I don't, I don't know why I don't have any. It's not on purpose. Not because I don't like them. I just, I, you know, every place has these. So, um, uh, anyway, uh, the uh, next one was the Canadian rocks glass. Yeah. And this Wait. one's, um, this one's my, one of my favorite ones. Yeah. Uh, do you have one of these? Yeah. I have, I have one of the tribe ones. Yeah. Same here. I've got the one uh, with the engraving. Ditto, yeah. yeah. I got the tribe yeah. one and that's it. This really, really works surprisingly well. I'm, I'm very impressed by it. Uh, yeah. This is just the straight walled, uh, glass like this. It, it doesn't lose too much of the, the the nosing properties that you get from something like a Glen Cairn, uh, but it does kind of have that greater air volume in there, so it doesn't punch you right in the face. And you know, it's I don't know, it's just all around a nice glass, nice to hold. And it, it looks amazingly fancy with a round ice ball in it. Yeah. Yes. Very luxurious. Luxury. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, it's it's one, it's one of my favorites simply because. Um, I don't drink anything neat, but I have seen you drink stuff neat, uh, Josh, out of it. And I'm going to try it eventually. But mixing cocktails, because of the bulb at the bottom, you can get really in there and get a really good stir out of everything and really get everything well incorporated in, in the glass if you don't want to use a shaker or anything like that. Sure. Um, I, 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 I really enjoy making cocktails in, uh, in those ones. Yeah, not, have, not not to not not to shame you know the regular rocks glass, but uh, it is my it is my preferred out of the two. I would agree for sure. For some reason, I've never made a cocktail in it though. But oh, yeah. uh, I don't I don't make many cocktails anyway. But yeah. when I do, I always seem to reach for this guy. Um, okay, moving on to the next right, the normal standard go to yeah. rocks glass, right? Yep. Uh, we we touched upon it pretty pretty well. You know, standard straight wall. Uh, great for you know your super high proof bourbons. Great for cocktails. Um, you know what? What you can't really knock it too much. It does its job. Yeah, really well. it's okay. Uh, just not you know it's too open. Like it doesn't have that kind of tulip shape. Yeah, like this guy does right. Uh, the tulip shape I feel like is really helpful for nosing whiskey. But yeah, 
you know, if there's nothing else around, it's fine. Uh, I've got a handful of these and, and I use them occasionally, but, but mostly they just kind of stay in the cabinet. Um, um, then the, the next one is the, probably the most divisive glass, I think. Oh yeah, I would say so. People either like it or they really hate it. Uh, the Norland glass, which is for those that don't know, this is a Norland glass. I do not have one. Yeah, I have a pair that I, I have some I mild buyer's remorse about. Oh, Brad has one. That's right. I forgot about that. Uh, double walled, like it's insulated, so it's great for you know it feels nice in the hand, and and uh, your hand has no chance of warming the whiskey inside. It's got a little bit of a wider you know like airspace in the inside there to so it doesn't quite punch you in the face if you got something high proof. I do actually like this for those cast strength bourbons here and there, but. I'm not sure I like it a lot more than the Canadian rocks glass, actually. Mm. It's it's all right, and I have them, but I don't think, like, if these broke, I wouldn't replace them, I don't think. Right. And, and as far as I have heard, I haven't really done any looking into buying them, but I've heard that they're a bit on the more expensive side. Yeah, these they were... Are, especially to get them into Canada, unfortunately, Vito, so you're screwed even more. Well, <laughs> well sh shucks, guys. Like, I, I'm I'm... What will Locker. you do? I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do now. They the do fit way. so nicely in my giant hands, though. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's helpful in that regard. The other thing that is kind of weird about it is it's got this really thick lip that, you know, like most Glencairns have kind of a wine glass edge. Uh, so does the Canadian Rocks glass. But, um, you know, that kind of fine glassware feel. Uh, this is probably easily twice as thick. Mm. Uh, so it does feel a little bit clunky when you're drinking from it, I guess. But yeah, not bad. I use it sometimes, but um, I, yeah, not my preference. Um, all right. So next is uh, pretty much my show now because no one has this glass probably. Um, a grappa glass. So grappa is just a high uh, spirit, Italian spirit. Um, I'm, I, I hate it, but I got gifted these as a wedding, uh, gift, uh, not my wedding, um, like a wedding souvenir. What do, what do you call it? in like, I, we, in Italian, in Italy, we're called, they're called Bomanetti. Oh, it's like something that you gift oh, to your guests. Yeah. A wedding favor. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, wedding yeah. Favor. sure. Something like uh, that. So I got these and I didn't know what I was going to do with them. And a couple of nights ago, I decided I'm going to do a, do a test of this of Glendronic 12 in a grappa glass and in a Glencairn. And something interesting happened. Um, I got a way fuller and richer nose out of this glass. Um, I was very surprised, super surprised. I I'm, wasn't the biggest fan of the Glendronic 12 um, through the pretty much the life of the bottle. It was okay, but it didn't like hit me. Mm -hmm. uh, out of this glass, it hit me really really nicely um i i uh, my thoughts are is that the alcohol gets trapped because the 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 bulb is so bulbous right so bulbous it's so bulbous uh oh. compared compared to the rest of the glass uh <laughs> that it gets all the alcohol gets trapped in the bulb and all that's left is all the flavors and aromatics that come from the whiskey sure um that's how I'm going to science it. Um, I don't know if that's right, but that's what it makes sense in my head and what that, I smelt. That was, sounds sciencey to me. Yeah. Um, Adam, you're the scientist, but uh, I just have science you there. But <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, the, if you happen to come across them, I, I, I would guess to think that they're fairly expensive. Um, I didn't do uh, enough research on the, on the, um, the cost of them, but if you happen to see them um, and are, interested give them a shot um it's it's worth it um in my opinion so I, I i was just picturing a scenario there that you have like a travel case with with like a pair of those grappa glasses and you just go to the bar and it's no 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 i brought my own glass and you bring out that enormous weird looking thing in so the pretentious <laughs> and, and force the bartender to pour your whiskey into there instead uh yeah no but it's 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 a pretty cool it's a pretty cool experience um and like i said i got it changed glendrona 12 for me but 
it's definitely a glass that I will not be reaching for on the regular, even though um, what I experienced with it, just because, um, you know, I won't find this anywhere outside of my house. Um, and they're a, a real pain in the butt to clean. Yeah, no but, doubt. You probably have to get a brush in there and like... Yeah, I made, a, I made a really bad mistake with this one. I put it in the dishwasher. Oh, and it and it cracked the, oh. the lip. So this one's going in the garbage, but I have a spare. So, um, yeah. Don't pro don't, tip. Don't put baby anything. bottle cleaner things. Perfect for Glen Cairns and all sort of glassware with uh, interesting mm. lips. Nice. Uh, I'm gonna have to get me one of those. Yeah. Um, and um, the last glass we're gonna talk about. It's one that nobody has. We can't even show it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, the the Riedel Sommelier glass. Uh, this is something my friend, well, everybody, everybody's friend. You all have met him. Jared uh, really likes these, and he's got a collection of them at his house. And I like them as well. It's it's about the size of a Glencairn, but, you know, with straight sides and then a, a flared um, lip to it. And uh, and then, like, a little wine glass base. So it's, so it's the overall volume and, like, the height of the... Uh, glass chamber in there is, is, is taller. And uh, I don't know, they're really nice. They're not quite as aggressive. It kind of takes uh, some of the edge off from what a Glencairn will do on the nosing. But um, yeah, you want to see it? Look it up. The Riedel. I, th glass. I think I think we can have Brad, um, Brad uh, pull up a quick image of that um, oh, as yeah. well. As well, make him do something. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, it's Bourbon Night. Um, uses these glasses. That's uh, right. They in, do in all, in all their videos. Um, Chad and Sarah over there, um, who we got the pleasure of meeting um, at the at the launch party and uh, at, right. and at a little tasting that that was happening. And uh, absolute delightful people. If you don't subscribe um, or um, have any watched any videos, definitely go ch check them out. They're um, they're awesome people. Yeah, yeah, Bourbon Night people were uh, were really cool. They do use those glasses. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I mean, that's there's probably other weird glassware out there, right? But uh, that quite a, pretty much covers the the gamut of stuff that's really whiskey centric. I think. Yeah. So. And... I found a picture. I found okay. a picture of it. Hey, he he did it. Brad, you're a hero. Gotta load the damn picture. There we go. There we go. There it is. Yeah, exactly. One of these things. Mm-hmm. Yep. I there mean, those go. look classy as fuck, too, so. Yeah. I think we might have to beep that. Why? <laughs> it's a whiskey show, Vito. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with that. We don't, we don't do cork squeaks here. We're a <laughs> This is not chill filtered. Um, with that out of the so way, <laughs> with that out of the way, what is next? We are going to hit our weekly dram. Yes. The weekly dram. This is where we're going to be tasting, uh, comparing, nosing, all that fun stuff that uh, everyone always asks about uh, rare whiskeys or whiskeys that you're interested in. Uh, whiskeys that you want to give a second chance and just want a second opinion on. Maybe we can convince you otherwise. Um, this week, we're doing a Talisker showdown. I think we, we chose the Talisker because, I mean, we all are giant, giant fans of Talisker, right? Like, that was one of my... It wasn't, it wasn't one of the first whiskeys I had, but it was certainly in the first five that I really enjoyed. Talisker was the... Talisker 10 was the whiskey that, when I had it, I... I didn't like whiskey to begin with. When I had it, I was like, there might be something here, but I can drink it right now. And that's what kind of catapulted me into my, my whiskey journey. So Talisker will always hold a big place in my heart uh, for pushing me into this. Um, and yeah, just everything's always good from them. Yeah. Never, had, never had a bad, never had a bad expression. I've really found too, uh, I've, I've obviously got a bunch of friends that are into whiskey, but I've got a bunch of friends that are a little bit whiskey curious. Maybe they're not quite as nerdy as all this, but uh, you know, they, they, they like it and want to learn a little bit about it. And it seems almost universal that those folks enjoy Talisker. Like it's a, it's a whiskey curious uh, 
person scotch, I think. It's just smoky enough, just interesting enough um, that uh, it's not boring, It's uh, but it's also uh, approachable yep. as well. Brad, how do you feel about Talisker? Um, I'm uh, sure you have a lot I to say I am a it. fan. Uh, I have, I think, seven or eight different uh, expressions from Talisker. You might be uh, able Basically, to. everything available in Canada and a couple extras that I've dragged from other places. Right. Uh, I haven't found a bad one yet, in, including just buying them sight unseen and sending them to Josh's house for the ones that I can't get shipped here. You know, so when so. you... Brad's going to be coming here in a few weeks, right? So... Uh, for level two, sommelier class. That's right. I cannot get this book out of here. There is no way to get it out without breaking the box, I swear. So this thing might have to get de destroyed if you want to find out what in the world is in this book. It's got to be some sort of epic secret if they keep it that hidden. <sighs> There's like a ribbon in front of it. I, don't, I, I wanted to get it out and look at it, but then I was afraid I was going to break something. But we'll figure it out when you get here. As long as you don't break the bottle, you can break the box. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it priorities. Um, All right, so um, Joshua, hit hit up uh, Talisker real yeah. quick. Yeah. Uh, so I thought you always heard that they're on the Isle of Skye, right? Which is uh, off the coast of Scotland. I think on towards the north side. Yeah, northwest side yeah. Uh, in in the inner Hebrides. Hebrides. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. I was there. I was there two years ago, and it's a, it's an absolutely beautiful place to visit. But anyways, um, I thought it was the only distillery there because you always hear that. But apparently, in the last year, there's another one that's opened. Uh, Brad pointed that out to me, so I didn't look like a total idiot by claiming it was the only <laughs> it was the only distillery on the Isle of Skye. I this I one of those we learned something. Yeah, right. Uh, Torapeg. Is that how you say it? Any idea? Uh, I guess. I have no idea. It's one of those unpronounceable Gaelic words, right? Torabeg. Uh, Torabeg. Torabeg. Let's go with um, that. So Talisker, like a lot of other distilleries, um, Lagavulin, Oban, I think Dalwini, I mean, they, they own so many things. It's owned by Diageo. Uh, and they're kind of famous for that uh, briny, salty, maritime kind of character um, to their whiskey. Um I have the distiller's edition right here with me today, which is, uh, it doesn't have an H statement on it, uh, but it is essentially from what I could find the, the tin, uh, but finished in Amoroso sherry casks. Um, and uh, Diageo does this a lot. They have several distiller's editions. There's a Talisker, this guy, there's a Lagavulin and Oban, probably some others, um, but they're all, all sort of wine finished, sherry finished stuff. Um, tried to figure out what in the world Amoroso was, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, Amoroso in Spanish means lovable. So workers would come home and, and they'd pick up their sherry to drink at home, but they would also ask for bottles of Oloroso sherry with a touch of Pedro Jimenez added in to sweeten it up a little bit to bring home to their wives so that the wine would taste more lovable or Amoroso. I thought that was kind of cute. So... That's what this is essentially 10 year old sherry uh, finished Talisker. Uh, probably chill filtered because Talisker generally is, but yeah. maybe maybe with the, uh, the Amoroso finish, maybe they didn't add any color. The uh, only, as far sure. as I, as far as I'm aware, am I echoing? Okay. Um, uh, as little, far as, I, yeah. All right. As far as I'm Go aware, ahead. the only Talisker expression that's not, that's non-chill filtered and uncolored is Nest Point. Uh, and, and I'm fairly sure that's, the, that's a very limited travel release. Yeah, that's I'm incredibly jealous of the travel release Talisker's. Yeah. I can't seem to get I want the Dark Storm really bad, which somebody somebody's picked up one and just needs to make their way back to Austin and bring it back. Somebody. Someone. Someone. Has. It's not me. Someone me. For, for once, it's not me. <laughs> for once, yeah. it's not me. Um, Steve, amazing whiskey cabinet. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I have the distiller's edition. And, and also, of course, I had the Talisker 18 that has been fantastic uh, that, that I've just made the last pour of. I still have some left in the glass here, and I want to compare the two side by side a little bit. But um, 
the next one was what you uh, yours, Brad, right? The uh, yeah, portrait. I happen to have one of it's. It's not a travel release, but I think it was like a European exclusive release at first or something. I'm not sure how some ended up in Canada, but the Port Re, which I think that's how you pronounce. It's another Gaelic word, so like right. I heard that's how you pronounce it, but Port Re, Port Rugi, something. <laughs> I don't know. Right. It's it's another one of these Talisker like double name things like the fifty seven North, like Port Re is the largest port city on the Isle of Skye. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's also Talisker finished in a port cask, so they they like doing double. So name. clever with the names those. They're Talisker. so clever. They're so. But yeah, and I, I think this is another one. I'm I'm pretty sure it's chill filtered. And I have no idea if they added color to it with the port finish or not, but it doesn't say that it's natural color, so it very well could be. Talisker does it a lot, so very possible. Somebody is saying uh, it's poor tree. Poor yeah, tree. The, t the poor town. Tree. The town's called poor tree. So okay, I, I, sure. would, I, I guess Let's you could, if you say, if you say port, port, port re really quickly, like an like a specific Irishman that we know is port, port, port re. Got okay. It. Say it real quick. Porry. Porry. Cool. Um, and then Vito has the one that I so badly want. So I was lucky enough to get gifted this. Um, all right, can you see it? Uh, Talisker Dark Storm. Right there. Li uh, travel release, one liter bottle. Um, definitely colored. Definitely chill filtered. Um, it's absolutely delicious um again it's an it's a non-age statement um t age less than 10 years it's no, but um really 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 rich um and uh this one's marketed as um being the peatiest and spiciest uh talisker um because of its heavily charred oak casks um, it doesn't say what was in it before, but I would assume bourbon, like most of the other Taliskers. Um, and um, essentially how you want to sort of look at this one, if you have never had it before or never even heard of it, um, in the base lineup, you have the 10. Uh, Talisker 10, which is delicious. I just finished a, a small pour of that to mm -hmm. get ready for this. Then you have the Talisker Storm, um, which is a little bit spicier, getting more into that uh, really more briny, peaty uh, taste because the barrels were charred uh, more. And then the Dark Storm, super dark, super charred, um, is the in that like my the triple threat Talisker triple threat. What I what I'm gonna coin right now. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's the extreme of of it, right? So if you want something in between, if Talisker tends a little bit too light and Dark Storm's a bit too uh heavy heavy for you the storm's a really nice medium uh but if you like the 10 and you like the storm for me the the dark storm the storm is a little bit underwhelming uh because mm -hmm. i'd rather have the the either the extreme than the middle for for my my taste makes sense it's, it sounds kind of analogous to the yard bag grooves Heavily, uh, heavily charred. Although the grooves, I think, was red wine casks or something. It was, yeah, it was red wine casks. This one doesn't state, but I'm going to assume that it was uh, ex bourbon. Um, it may have held uh, Talisker Ten previously. I'm just guessing, but um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's at it's it's a recharred oak cask is what right. they was what they officially say. <laughs> Burned within an inch of its life. True. Yeah. <laughs> if you, have you have you seen have you, if no one's ever seen. Uh, extremely charred uh, stave, oak stave before. It's uh, like a war zone. <laughs> yeah. I have one in my garage. I should have grabbed it. But nah, it's, right. it's okay. Uh, let's get to tasting these. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got, uh, like I said, I've got the 18 here, which, you know, is not too dissimilar from the 10. I mean, it's just a little more, you know, rounded, ad added complexity, and, you know, not... Uh, not quite so spiky as the 10, you know? And then comparing them side by side, the, the sherry influence really just jumps out at me. Like it loses some of the spiky uh, notes that in the 18, I get the, like a spiciness that's similar to uh, anise. 
like almost a licorice type note to it along with the salt and the smoke. Uh, whereas that spiciness is kind of gone here in the, uh, in the distiller's edition. I get all of the, the sweet, grapey, whiny type notes. So. And actually kind of a, kind of an ashiness to the smoke uh, where it's a lot more elegant on the 18. Uh, the 18 is definitely more refined, whereas this is a little more in your face. Yeah, it's, probably, it's definitely not aged that long. Yeah. I mean, overall, it's it's really tasty. And I, I, I'm kind of a sucker for uh, cask finishes of, of all kinds. I, I don't know, something I really like about it. But the 18 is just such a nice, magnificent whiskey that's a, a perfect balance between youth and age, I think, that... Uh, you know, this, this comes across as a bit aggressive in comparison, but drinking it by itself, I think it's fantastic. Mm. Um, what about you, Brad? How's that Port Rugi? The, the Port Rugi? The Port Rugi. <laughs> is, is, it's pretty good. Uh, it's definitely not my usual thing. It's def far sweeter than most Taliskers because of the port finish. And usually I don't really go for the sweeter end of whiskey, mm -hmm. but it is very much like it's, it's weirdly unsurprising in that it feels exactly like what my brain thinks Talisker 10 and a port finish would taste like, like it is exactly that it's a good combo, but it's not surprising at all. The only weirdly surprising thing is in the finish. I get like, uh, cocoa powder like from cheap chocolate cereal like cocoa puffs oh so like a chocolate but a dusty chocolate yeah i, and I don't know where that's coming from <laughs> <laughs> but other like it's it's just tasty and it's nice it's probably one of the less spiky taliskers too probably because of the sweetness sort of undercutting the brine and everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it is very good it's very nice if you get a chance to try it i highly suggest it uh, I have no idea if it's ever going to be openly available in the U.S. because I don't know why it's even available in Canada because it's supposed to be like a European exclusive thing, but I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite good. So you that was available just at the store in Canada, or you had to order it? Uh, yeah, no, it, it's available in in stores in at least some provinces. Damn it, I haven't seen it in Ontario, <laughs> but uh, it is in Canada. Yeah. Well, lucky you some reason I, <laughs> I don't ask questions when i find these things yeah, that's that's them. true it's best not to ask questions just accept the good fortune um and uh so Vito with the dark storm then this is just uh great um so i always like comparing to the 10 uh because it is almost like how brad um compared the the idea that uh, well, the, how we taste the uh, portry, I'm going to try and pronounce it right, the portry of uh, the port and the Talisker 10 mixed together. That's exactly how you would think it. Now, mm -hmm. just think now, just think Talisker 10, um, extra, with extra barrel char, um, and what that gives to, what that will impart onto the whiskey. Spices, um, a bit of, um, a bit of that uh, smoky characteristic, right? A, sure. bit of a, a bit of ashiness as well. Right. Um, so it, for me, it takes everything about Talisker 10 and imparts almost an Isla characteristic to it. Okay. Um, right. So I always get green apples uh, from Talisker 10s. Um, uh, uh, cooking cedar, Spanish cedar, I get. Um, brine, a little bit of peat, a bit of spice, um, a little bit of pork, like a cured pork, um, and a very, very slight ashiness to it. Um, with, uh, the dark storm, it's all of those just taken up to 10, um, 10 for an Island, uh, an Island whiskey, not a 10, uh, uh Isla whiskey. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't compare to Ardbeg 10 or Lafroig or those, the heavy hitters in Isla, but it takes everything about an Island whiskey and just brings it right up to the level, um, right below, uh, Isla. Um, it's just, it's just really, really good. So that's interesting. That's uh, I've I would love to try all three of these side by side now because 
I've heard us describe some differences, but I've heard us describe a lot of similarities too. We've all referenced it being like the 10 plus X, right? Yeah. Uh, and being being non-H statements, I feel like that's uh, they use the 10 as the base for, for all of these, right? So, sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, I know the um, it's it's interesting when you when you're comparing um, uh, distillery expressions, um, what you can find with the uh, with all the similarities and uh, pulling notes and whatnot. It sounds like yours is has has a lot of similarities to mine. Uh, the the distillers edition versus the dark storm. Um, but where mine has sort of that grapey notes, yours has a little bit more smoke and char and stuff like that. Yeah, de definitely. Um, like on the taste, it's like smoked bacon. Like if you put bacon on a barbecue, um, like I get that, I get a uh, heavier, um, a heavier peat than from the nose and get this, I get honey honey uh golden fruits and uh oddly nori so like dried seaweed uh sure that makes sense pu pu punching through um all that smoky characteristic that hits me up front and then all like it just kind of fades and then all the sweetness comes right back up through through all that and so it's it's it really develops well um as as you drink it that sounds phenomenal that's one of my favorite combinations in whiskey is the uh smoke and fruit combo with you know those other flavors in there but if it's got that uh if you've got a fruitiness and then a smoke within some salty and savory character it seems like it's hitting all of those corners to make it a really complex satisfying whiskey yeah um yeah no um for anyone here what would you what would you rate uh rate your whiskeys out of 10 out of ten, I'm terrible at this. I'm terrible. Okay, so, at this. so, so we're gonna we're gonna start a system. Ten bean, I would buy again with in a heartbeat. Uh, five bean, I won't turn it down if given if I'm given a pour. One bean, uh, respectively decline. So like ten, ten's more of a once it's done, I must replace it as soon as possible. Yeah, I see. I see. That makes sense. No, uh, that's. I don't know that I would say I would replace this as soon as possible, but I would definitely buy it again. So I guess that's that's what a seven and a half, eight, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd, pro I'd probably go like a seven on this. It's good. I would definitely recommend people try it if they get a chance, but like you don't necessarily need to chase after it too hard. It's not one of the unicorns or anything. Right. For me, this is a nine. Um, I'd give it a 10, but it's incredibly difficult uh, at least for myself, to come back into Canada with more than one bottle, because when you come back into Ontario specifically, you got to pay taxes on the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on bottles. So um, I can only bring so many bottles back at a time. Um, if I'm not bringing back a bottle, I'm 100% going to restock on this on this guy. Um, it's so so good, but because of the limits to getting it back to my house <laughs> a point gets deducted if, yeah. if it was if it was off the shelf 10 all day the availability yeah, yeah. If, it, if, if it was in the stores 10 10 10 10 but that, so I, that... I like christina's suggestion here for, <laughs> for, ref, for a reference of canadian mist yeah for never from canadian mist to what like uh canadian mist to uh dream cask 1815 yeah, yeah, one of those. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, on a on a scale from Canadian Mist, Canadian Mist to 1815, I'd I'm, rate this say, uh, I'd rate this a Nougatal. <laughs> sure, fair. I see. I'd do the same. Yeah. I'd rate it a Nougatal. Sure. <laughs> All um, right. Cool. All well, right. Yeah. So that's I, that's I, cool. You made me want the Dark Storm even more if that was possible. So you'll get so you. good. <laughs> you'll, you'll 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 get one. Yep. All right. Um, so um, we're going to uh, go right into what we like to call the fiddly bits. We're gonna call the fiddly bits because fiddly bits. So um, fiddly. You gotta have be, the fiddly bits. You gotta have the the fiddly bits. This is gonna be a recommendation center. Uh, just a very quick. Hey, um, I tried this recently. T take a look at it. Um, I went to an event, um, upcoming event maybe, 
um, that you're really excited for, um, or you know, YouTube channels, music, books, music. Oh, I said music twice. Sure. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I'm going to kick off, um, the professionals, I, very professional, <laughs> absolutely 100% professional. Yes. So last week I attended a Glenfiddich tasting hosted by the Canadian ambassador for Glenfiddich. Um, and on the menu was the, um, all the experimental series. Uh, they had the IPA, the XX, uh, winter storm and the firing cane. Um, the IPA was uh, really interesting. I would never have expected to get as much of a that IPA bitterness out of a whiskey before, but it was there. It tickled me a little bit, um, mm. and uh, it made it interesting. I probably wouldn't buy a bottle of it, but I can see that you know, for like the hop heads out there that love craft IPAs, um, that would be right up their alley. Just how ticklish are you? Very ticklish. <laughs> um. See, I, I never, I've had a few hopped, I haven't had the Glenfiddich, but I've had a few hopped whiskeys and it's one of those things that I just personally really hate. And I don't hate hoppy beer at all. Yeah. Uh, I have no problem drinking IPAs, but for some reason you put a lot of hops into a whiskey context and it starts to get nasty for me. Yeah. But that said, I'd try it, I'd try it. You know, there may be it's, one out there that's it, awesome. It, I, I say it's worth a try if you like hoppy beers. It's very interesting. It, it, and it, the same goes for the, um, excuse me, the Jameson castmates. Right, mm -hmm. um, that they're influenced very well by the by the IPA and the um, the stout cast that they that they used to do that. So um, it's those are really well done. The IPA is well done too. It's just um, it's just not a bottle that I would uh, I would buy myself. Sure. Um, the double X was where it got really interesting. So with the double X is it's not twenty, um, is what I found out. I I thought it was the Glenfiddich twenty. It is the XX. Um, and, uh, they call it the XX because it's not a 20 year old whiskey. It's a, it's a 20 barrel blend. Um, so with, without having to be confused and people up in arms, they just call it the XX. Um, so it's 20 barrels, uh, all selected by all 20 ambassadors for the, for the distillery. Um, and, um, you know, they have your standard European oak, uh, ex bourbon, uh, but uh, no sherry or, or Oloroso or anything like that, um, except for one. The Canadian ambassador chose to uh, chose a port cask um, to blend in, and being a sucker for port, um, it blew me away. It was that one cask of port dominated that 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 pour that I had, and it was glorious. It was so good, uh, very rich. Um, that's crazy. It's like one twentieth of the blend, and yeah, yeah it, it took me it took me by 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 uh, by by surprise. Uh, it's but like it was, the same thing would happen if you did like one peated cask and a bunch of unpeated stuff. Like it would just yeah, the influence sure. is strong enough that it would be noticeable. Right. Yeah. Right. The so powerful that was, flavor. That was definitely really good. I would I would consider buying a bottle of that, uh, depending on what the price is. Um, um, the price is in, in Ontario. We're um, we're not exactly the cheapest province in Ontario in Canada to buy whiskey from. About um, how much is that in in where you are? If I'm not mistaken, I think the ambassador said it's going to be about ninety dollars Canadian, which is about seventy five, seventy seventy five American. Okay, um, I'm if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, but yeah, so that was that. Uh, the winter storm, as expensive as it is. It is mm. glorious. If you like ice wine, um, it's aged exclusively in Peller Estate Ontario Winery ice uh, wine barrels. Um, Peller Estate is my favorite Ontario winery. I love their ice wine. The second I tried it, it blew me away. Um, if it wasn't $400, I would totally buy a bottle. Uh, so ice wine, ice wines that uh, they um, it's like how they make certain whiskeys like um, Applejack and stuff like that, right? They freeze it and then it becomes higher alcohol content because of that. Is that right? It, or, like they, they pull the grapes after the first frost. Or yeah. Like there's, oh, it's the grapes, grapes, not the actual the wine. Are frozen yeah. ish from from the first frost. Uh, OK, OK. Yeah. Um, so uh, but it was beautiful. I love ice wine. 
if you like ice wine and can afford the bottle, it is amazing. Um, so, so, so good. Uh, Kent, it was, it was my winner. If it was a bit, if it was within my price range, it would be my, my winner, uh, overall. Um, but the winner overall for me was the firing cane. Um, so good. Peated expression. Um, Glenn Fittick actually does, uh, one peated run a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, they started fiddling with, um, with, uh, the Pete, uh, from Bel. I think it would get it from Belvini. Not sure. Who's next? I think it's Belvini that's next door to Glenn Fittick. Um, yeah. Um, and it's just the right amount of peat. Um, if you were trying to get anyone into peated whiskey, um, I would definitely either use that or the Talisker 10. Uh, but I'd almost say the Fire and Cane because of the, the amazing uh, switch that happens um, on the finish where it's you get a bit of peat and then it just disappears and it's like a sugar cane just like i know it, it's it's one of those it, things that every time you smell it every time you taste it it changes a little bit it's all yeah. smoke at first and then it's all it's all uh molasses sweetness and and yeah, yeah. it's yeah. and um it's Maple also syrup. so it's peated it's peated glenfiddich um but if i'm not mistaken it's also aged in um I think Jamaican rum casks or Caribbean rum casks as well, yeah. uh, which uh, for me um, would impart that um, uh, sugar cane, uh, right. it, all, all those sugar cane notes to it's it. It's kind of like winter spice notes too, right? Like yeah. uh, you know, clove, cinnamon, stuff like that. Um, that. Everybody that I've talked to, myself included, you, Gretchen, my wife, she liked it. Um, quite a bit, uh, a few of the local Austin Magnificent Bastards. In fact, uh, we recommended that Rex try it. So I think you should probably see it on an upcoming episode of Whiskey Vault. Nice. nice. Um, yeah, so, it's fantastic stuff. So that's, those are my recommendations for really interesting expressions from Glenfiddich that's uh, trying to branch out. They're, they're trying to not be that, um, you know, oh, there's Glenfiddich bottle. It's like I see it everywhere. They're trying different things and uh, doing good things. So, yeah, it's yeah. one of those creative distilleries. I appreciate that, and I always kind of wrote off Glenfiddich as kind of one, it's one of those behemoth brands, you know, yeah. that's like everywhere. And and but they're doing interesting, creative things and trying stuff. And you know, I I, I like distilleries that do that and do it well. And the Fire and Cane is just a great example of that. Yep. Uh, so yeah, that's mine. Um, Josh, what do you have? Um, so just this week, I think, uh, the Jim Murray whiskey Bible came out and a little proud moment for me here. Cause everybody knows I'm a big Texas whiskey evangelist, uh, if you will, uh, two Texas whiskeys, won really high awards in the Jim Murray whiskey Bible. One, both of which I have one was the, uh, something like the uh, craft distillery uh, whiskey of the year was the Garrison Brothers Balmeray, uh, which comes in this tiny, tiny bottle, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but it's an excellent bourbon. It's It's got some kind of interesting double cask finish to it. Uh, you know, they, they take the barrels and then move them into new barrels and age them for another period of time. Uh, I think there's also some kind of oxygenation process I heard about. Um, the details on it aren't really uh, too out there, but um, fantastic, fantastic stuff. I think it's one of the nice, uh, nicest bourbons that Garrison Brothers has come out with. Um, the runner-up in that same category was personally my favorite of the two, the Balcones Peated Single Malt, which uh, you could only get at the distillery as a limited release for their 10th anniversary. So I really think... Right now, Texas whiskey is kind of having a coming of age moment, uh, if you will. Yeah, with uh, all, with with all the with with all the boom around uh, around the um, the state and um, just the expansion of all the craft distilleries into uh, into the association, there's yep. going to be a lot, a lot of attention is going to be on Texas now, and yep. it's it's worth it. 
We have the Texas Whiskey Association that just came out. Of course, uh, you know, Crowded Barrels involved with that. Garrison Brothers, Balcones, Andalusia, Iron Root Republic, uh, Ranger Creek in San Antonio, Treaty Oak, which is right here in Austin. Still Austin, which uh, they have new make spirit right now, but they've got some bourbon aging as well. Um, yeah, it's 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 really coming together, and they're trying to make Texas uh, whiskey a defined category, and that's something I think in, in you know in a week or two. Uh, we could go into a, a little more in depth about, but um, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool that in one of the most well-regarded whiskey publications out there, the number one and number two selections were Garrison Brothers and Balcones. Uh, speaking of Balcones, on Saturday, Gretchen and I and I th roughly like a dozen people are going up to Waco uh, for Balcones' uh, 10th anniversary party. Um, they're coming out with two new single malts, which are, I think, second fill cast. It's similar to their Mirador uh, single malts, uh, but one's a sherry finished and one's a port finished uh, single malt. Uh, I'm not going to, they have these Spanish names, Hechicheros and Brujeria. I don't know. I'm probably not saying that correctly at all. If only we knew a Mexican. If, if only, if only. Uh, and then we're also supposed to have a taste of uh, the weeded bourbon, which I, I did get a chance to taste uh, at another event a while ago, which is quite good. Um, it's kind of unusual for them because Balcones is usually pretty bold, wood forward, uh, high proof, et cetera. And for them to do a, a, a sweeter expression like a weeded bourbon, um, it's, you know, it's not mild or pretty or, or boring by any means, but it's just, you know, a little something different for them. That, uh, demonstrates their their versatility and the range that they can do. So pretty excited for that. Should be a good time. Nice. Um, and then uh, Brad had uh, a new YouTube channel he found. It was a uh, yeah. So it, it's called the Rock Gut Review uh, by Ed <laughs> O'Meara. I think he was in the chat actually. I'm not sure if he still is. Let's see. Uh, but he's been doing reviews with his dad. I assume he's referred to as the old man which I, I'm assuming is his old man, but uh, I don't know. But they do reviews on sort of weird things, like they did a Fireball and another cinnamon whiskey, and they just like bottom shelf sort of weird things so far. And it's really well done. And cool. as a fully well-established uh, new YouTube channel, I, I figure it's our duty as professional YouTubers the professionals, the professionals. To, to help the little guy. Yeah, we got to help the people first, just starting oh, out. Give exactly. Them when, yeah. when they're just starting out, you know, it's hard. Right. When people are just starting out. So, uh, no, it's it's really, it's actually really great. It's well put together. It I'll put fun. a link in, in the chat, and then I'll, I'll put a link in the video description thing when we do it. But, yeah, it's nice. called the Rock Gut Review, and it's, it's really good. He's done three or four videos so far, I think. It's pretty new, but it's great, and you should check it out. Pretty yeah, sure a, we met Ed in Austin during the Crowded Barrel opening, didn't we? We did. Yeah, we met him. Yeah, yeah. he came to dinner and then uh, came to the uh, Friday night uh, happy hour we did. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to have to go check it out. Uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. You yeah. said they did Fireball? They did Fireball. Yeah, they did Fireball and another like weird cinnamon whiskey hell, thing. Hell, like, hell, hell, hell water. <laughs> hell water. That's, yeah, that's hell water. Cool. It's uh, it it literally looks like uh, you took red food coloring and dripped it into water. Oh it god, does. it does. It looks horrible. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, according according to the, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but uh, it makes it makes other things palatable. <laughs> okay, by comparison, by comparison, oh, de yeah. definitely definitely give them a shot a, a look, guys. Um, it's uh, they're a lot of fun, and uh, Ed's a good a cool good cool dude, and uh, yeah, show them so, show them some love. Right on. Um, all right, so we're going to take um, some questions that our Demi host has uh, acquired through. Yes, um, I've, I've collected a couple of random questions. I'm sure I missed some because the chat is chaos, but I, I managed to grab some. So I, I saw one from Jeffrey Patron, which is Patron. a question for the boys, which I'm assuming is all of us. I think we're what boys. is your favorite gateway whiskey for the Dram Curious? Mm. Mm. Um. Well, I'm. I feel a bit by. I. Oh, this is a hard question because it depends. Because you want to. You want to kind of qualify them because if they. If they like wine, I would start them off with something uh, from high from the Highlands or Space Side. 
mm-hmm. um, something you know easy and approachable. You know, start start if they've never ha- if they've never had any drops of whiskey, start with the Glenfiddich. Um, you can if you find if you have Monkey Shoulder in your reservoir and you, they're at your house, you can try give that uh, give them that. Uh, myself, I tend to start with uh, Habiki Harmony. Um, yeah, okay, that, I haven't tried that. That's a good. That's a good. Uh, yeah, um, I've done that, a, that a I've, call. I've done a couple of a couple of um, like intro tastings to some of my friends that have been curious with you know what you know what I'm involved with uh, with uh, you guys and uh, the whisk community as a whole, and um, I've always started them off with um, um, Habiki Harmony, and then I move into a Red Breast Twelve. And then from there, I kind of, I kind of curate it a little bit, um, try and try and test out my uh, fledging psalm skills. Um, but uh, I usually start with the Habiki Harmony. It's 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 friendly. It's got a, a lot of nice uh, spice notes uh, without being too overpowering. It uh, it's got a touch of peat, almost 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 unnoticeable, but it's it's just there. Um, so if they don't like Pete and they pick it up, you know where not to bring them. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it, it won't. It's not. I haven't met anyone that hasn't been able to finish a pour of it. Um, and it and they keep on going after that. So uh, for me, if you need a recommendation, that's what I would say. Um, if you don't know where to go, Habiki Harmony. If you have it, is it, I've had a lot of uh, positive feedback on that one. All right. Yeah, that's a solid recommendation. I've I've got some in the cabinet here. It's- it's definitely not a go-to for me. I don't love it, but it's pretty good. But I could see like it's nice and friendly enough that somebody that's curious, that would be a good recommendation. It is. Another thing I would probably add to that list if you happen to have it, since it's discontinued now, is the Compass Box Asyla. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It is amazingly smooth and friendly. Mm-hmm. But it's just it's just got enough little spiky interestingness that you can kind of try to gauge where to go next from it. Uh, but it, it's it's not going to you know stab anybody or uh, you know make anybody freak out. From probably the uh, probably the compass, bo- the, well the friendlier side of compass box in general. Like if you had some hedonism or something. Well, yeah, hedonism or even like the uh, what is it? Uh, Great King Street. Great King Street. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll tell you the one that I've had the most success with. And well, Fire and Cane may kind of take the top spot now. I got to try it on more people. But uh, the one I've definitely had the most success with is Bunahaven 12. Yeah. Mm. It's, you know, I mean, it's it's not super interesting or, or you know, if you're a whiskey drinker, you may find it a little bit sweet or a little bit uh, simple. But um we the first time uh, Gretchen ever had it was uh, we did a little scotch tasting in the uh, vaults, and that was part of the tour of Scotland, right? And she, Gretchen, I don't think had ever liked a whiskey before, and all of a sudden, this was one where she said, "Oh, oh, that's that's not terrible. That's that's actually pretty good." Um, I used it in a scotch tasting I gave her some friends last week. Uh, that turned out to be. Uh, one of the guy's top choice, like if he was going to pick his favorite, it was the Boonhaven 12. I've given it to my sister and my brother-in-law. They both liked it. So I've had a lot of success with that one. It's nice and approachable. It's got some nice kind of um, cherry notes and a uh, little bit oaky, um, a little bit vanilla, stuff like that. So it's got some kind of bourbon-ish flavors too. If somebody's a bourbon fan, uh, that's a good way to get into scotch. So I think it's, it's one like... Um, it's kind of a universal appeal to it. It's it's a, it's a really good one. Yeah. So yeah, I think that would be my choice. Somali Brad. Cool. Yes. What do you start your tastings off with? Uh, well, it it would depend on the person, uh, but usually probably a Compass Box blend, Great King Street, or the artist. Uh, the art. I think it's just artist blend. Whatever the, the artist one is. That's right. Uh, or a Sila, uh, Habiki Harmony would be. Very good. Uh, the Jameson's Castmate Stout, if they're into yeah. like dark chocolate or anything mm-hmm. like that, like it sort of depends on the pl- the flavor profiles that I get from them, I guess. Yep. Right. And then from there, you know, we can veer off to maybe like a Talisker Storm if they want to go less sweet and more briny, or maybe like a Highland Park Twelve or something if they want to just try a little bit of peat, but. Not super into it, or another Japanese thing, Nika from the Barrel. If they're more into like the 
the whatever the the that sweetness that's not sugar <laughs> i don't know what the hell you can call yeah. it from, yeah. from the barrel yeah the the japanese stuff is generally pretty friendly and approachable and has that kind yeah. of pretty quality to it yeah. yeah yeah it's usually pretty friendly for people mm. yeah and then just uh, go from there so how, how much more time do we have for questions do we have time for another one or two i think we got a we got a couple more very interesting questions that we yeah, really um, i'm game through. for it uh, including the this next one from Gretchen Galladay, who oh, you might recognize as oh. being Josh's wife. Oh boy. Which makes this question very interesting. Vito, are you wearing pants? <laughs> <laughs> I am indeed wearing pants. If you need proof, for the audio listeners, sorry. This is why you have to tune this is why you have to tune in. You can't hear pants. Or or why you shouldn't tune in, depending on what your threshold is. For this you. is how he got the nickname Vito Crotch. <laughs> All right. And, and one more here just to, to round out the questions, I guess. We got one from Timothy Barth, which is for me, I guess, directly. Uh, what do you consider expensive for whiskey? To which I'll say, it's a real shame that we're out of time for questions and we just have to move <laughs> on. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, it's a, you know, may maybe next time we'll we'll have time to to answer such things. All he right. Doesn't, so he doesn't have an answer. He doesn't have. An I answer. haven't found the answer yet. I I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Right. I don't know yet. Um, it's it's very subjective. It's a very subjective question. You have to take a lot of things into consideration. Of course. Uh, so it's not something that we can answer. Uh, for me personally, um, the most expensive bottle I've ever bought was uh, the Octomore uh, 7.1 right there. Mm -hmm. It was $225 Canadian. Uh, but then um, other than that, all my other bottles um, are 120 Canadian and under. Um, the Lagavulin 12 right here being the, on the high end and then everything else pretty much under $100 Canadian. Yeah, I think just shy of 200 was probably the most expensive single bottle. I think, yeah, probably uh, probably the Octomore, I think 7.3 was about that, like 180 or something like that. Um, that's getting pretty up there. I mean, you know, I, I walk past the lock cases in the stores and the stuff they keep behind the counter, and, you know, yeah. I've gotten lucky enough and had enough generous uh, awesome friends to be able to try some of those super expensive, hard to find uh, whiskeys. But um, for it's, me personally, if I'm buying for my own collection, like 200 starts to get pretty painful. I usually so, would like to be under 100. Yeah. But, so would you say like 150 is a decent, like 150, you're not questioning it? Over 150, you're questioning it? I'm definitely questioning it. I mean, I'm not, you know. Yeah, you know, of course. It's just one of those. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, everything's sure. like I said. It's it's every every everyone's situation is different, mm -hmm. uh, right. uh, and that's where uh, mooch skills come in, into play. Absolutely, uh, gotta gotta upgrade those mooch skills if you want to try some expensive whiskeys. Yeah, uh, I, and I mean it's it's definitely a, a game of diminishing returns. You know, yeah. once you pass, you know, e even under two hundred bucks, like more than two hundred dollars, and you're not getting the same level of increase in quality as you are spending the money so it's more for the experience the rarity you know the the whole the whole kind of experience package rather yeah, than yeah a 500 dollar whiskey, whiskey is five times better than yeah. a 100 dollar whiskey although there are some amazing <laughs> expensive whiskey <laughs> totally absolutely uh, but generally speaking you're probably not going to get your money's worth if that's what you're going for specifically. There's plenty of really great whiskeys you can have a lot cheaper than, you know, going like four or five figures for some of the insane whiskeys. Yeah, like, I mean, like, it's a different argument. Like, if you're a bang for the buck person and that's like the, 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 the lens through which you view your whiskey journey, then uh, yeah. bang for the buck, you're probably not going to be buying 200, 500. Two thousand dollar bottles, right? Uh, because if, you're not if you're really a crazy person. If you're a crazy person trying to create interesting whiskey experiences for groups of people, like a certain person has been, <laughs> we know uh, anybody. Then like you spend a little more sometimes, and you know it can be worth it for the experience, even Absolutely. if the whiskey itself isn't necessarily, you know, worth 
10 or 20 or 40 times, you know, a normal bottle might cost you. And some legendary exp experiences have been had. So, yes. um, yeah, I think, I think what we should do next, uh, maybe in the next couple of episodes, um, is maybe do a showdown of, um, um, our favorite budget, uh, whiskeys. Absolutely. Like, like your, sure. you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be the cheapest bottle, but something that's very affordable that gives you a lot of punch, bang for your buck, bang for your buck, um, and uh, talk about that. Let me just ask a preemptive question: Do I get extra points if it comes in a plastic bottle? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. You get Canadian points, which is half an American point, but it's still points. It has right. less freedom than America. Uh... <laughs> a lot less freedom. <laughs> but you get negative points if I sent it to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, see. I see. I'm gonna have. To, I'm gonna have to think on that one. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think uh, we're gonna call it there. Um, so um, on behalf of Josh and Brad, I want to thank everybody for joining us on episode zero um, of the Cast Strength it did podcast. Say zero. <laughs> yeah, I did say episode zero on this on the, it's all on the video. experimental man. It's the experimental <laughs> one. We're Glenn. We're Glenn Fittick up in here. Mm -hmm. um but yes uh you guys uh please uh uh comment um contact us let us know what you liked what you didn't anything we can improve on i'm gonna get my mic situation figured out um because i or know you're it fired. or oh god what am i gonna do um yeah so um thank you um and um quick shout outs um let's shout out uh First and foremost, uh, the three of us, but everyone in the comments, uh, you guys have been awesome. Um, the chat. Yeah, thank you so much for watching, and everybody that uh, kind of uh, brought in uh, other viewers. I see, I see Dan Dewberry here. He uh, he hosts a local Scotch tasting here in Austin, and I got an email today that he posted up on his uh, Scotch tasting group page uh, for that event, telling everybody to come check it out. So, Dan, thank you. That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna scare all those people away. <laughs> <laughs> They're now terrified. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, get out of here, guys. Yeah. All righty. Good times. Good times. Very good times. We're gonna keep this going. Like I said, everyone, uh, let us know uh, what you think, and um, we're going to uh, leave you with a little bit of DJ Quaid at. Uh, dance out of here with Slancha <laughs> Slancha One, two, three, jump